1911, a fire erupted in a New York City garment factory. Within 20 minutes, 146 people, mostly women, were dead. The lives lost were a tragedy, but the safety hazards in the factory, the ill-equipped fire department, and the fact many workers had recently protested for better working conditions all made the disaster that much worse. And because of it, the course of the American labor movement was changed forever. This is history. Dark history. At the turn of the 20th century, America's economy was booming, immigration soared, and many immigrants found work in the garment industry. Shirtwaists, or waists as they were called at the time, were a particularly popular garment. Blousy yet feminine, women were able to wear them without a corset, which made them especially appealing. Many different garment shops produced shirtwaists, and Max Blank and Isaac Harris, based out of New York City, were known as the Shirtwaist Kings. Max Blank and Isaac Harris were immigrants themselves. They were Russian Jews. In 1900, they founded the Triangle Waist Company, and they found great success. At the time, a job at Triangle was considered a really good job. The overwhelming majority of garment shops were very small. They were set up in single rooms or in homes. Triangle was a big company. They had a lot of space. They had windows. They they had airflow, they had light, they had electricity. But while the conditions of factories like Triangle may have been a step above small, dark, in-home garment shops, they were still far from humane. Long hours. Probably around 10 hours a day, at least Monday through Friday. You know, and maybe, you know, six or eight or 10 uh, on Saturday. But it was normal for these lower skilled workers to work six days a week. You have child labor, bad sanitation. Little pay, sexual harassment. In buildings that in many ways fit the definition of what you might call a wet shop. Looking back, it's pretty self-evident why they would want to unionize. In 1909, Claire Limlick led what is now known as the Uprising of the 20,000. It was the largest strike by female workers in American history up to that date. And most of the participating women worked in New York shirtwaist factories they demanded better hours, fairer pay, and safer working conditions. Some garment factories conceded, but Blank and Harris saw the strike as an insult. As such, not all Triangle factory workers participated in the strike, and those who did faced consequences. One thing they had to lose was their job. We hear you organizing, you're fired. Blank and Harris, they not only didn't concede, they hired thugs to go out to the picket lines and beat their workers. People who were leading the labor organization, the women who were doing that were courageous. The strike ultimately proved a failure for the workers at Triangle. In the months after the strike, Triangle continued to operate in the top three floors of the Ash Building, and the conditions remained extremely dangerous. Obstacles to emergency escape were hidden in plain sight. There was very little floor space due to long sewing tables crammed close together doors pulled inward instead of pushing outward. The staircase was built into a ventilation shaft instead of separate from it. Buckets of water intended to be used in the case of a fire would often evaporate or fill with lint. And at the time, there were no regulations for companies to have fire drills or post placards for how to escape. Moreover, the policy was reported to be at closing time, they would lock all the doors but one so that each worker as they left could have their pockets checked in case they were trying to steal anything. The workers at Triangle were in danger before the fire ever started. March 25th, 1911 was a Saturday workday. It was near the end of the day and workers were preparing to head out for the night. On the eighth floor of the building, bins under the cutting tables were full of highly flammable fabric scraps. No one can be sure if it was a cigarette butt, a match, faulty machinery, or something else that caused a spark. Something landed in one of those rag bins and caught fire. Fed by the oxygen pouring in through the open windows, the fire very quickly became too big to put out. The operators on the eighth floor phoned the executive offices on the 10th floor first to warn them of the fire, but the ninth floor was not notified at all. There's hundreds of workers there. No one on the ninth floor knew that there was a fire burning below them while above them everyone was leaving the building. Within minutes, chaos ensued. Panicked employees did everything in their power to escape the rapidly growing fire. Desperate, they ran for the exit doors, but found all except one to be locked. And to everyone's horror, the narrow passageway behind the single open door was already filled with smoke and flames. 
the door opened inward, so the crush of people rushing for the door would have made it hard to pull it open. The elevator was running for only a precious few minutes before the tracks bent from the heat. Without an elevator, some women threw themselves down the elevator shaft, only to meet a fatal end. Exiting by fire escape also proved disastrous. There was one, it was very rickety. There was a rush, there was a press. There were people literally burning behind them. And this flimsy metal groaned under the weight of so many people on it until finally pulled away from the building and dumped everyone into a locked courtyard below. The fire department was called into action, but for many victims trapped in the fire, this attempt to save lives was futile. Some of us who have horrible memories of 9-11 and fire and something at a building. That's what was going on in the Triangle Fire. When the fire department arrived, their equipment proved inadequate. Nets for catching falling bodies ripped under pressure, while ladders, when extended to their full length, didn't reach the top floors. Imagine being up on that ledge with the fire literally right behind you, seeing the very tip of that ladder 25 feet below you and thinking, how am I going to jump and land on that? And the answer is you can't. In approximately 20 minutes, 146 people, mostly young immigrant women, were dead. Triangle was a catalyst for change for several reasons. First, the fire was very visible in one of the most advanced cities of the world on a Saturday afternoon. Lots of people saw it happen. It was horrific. It is not something you will ever forget. Secondly, the victims were mostly women. Third, these victims were mostly immigrants who had hoped to find a better life here and instead they were killed. Fourth, I think a lot of people at the time remembered the strike. They remembered that these people at this shop tried to get protections and they were unable to, and now they're dead. Because of mass public outrage, Max Blank and Isaac Harris were indicted for manslaughter in May 1911. 23 days after their indictment, they were acquitted. Three years later, after 23 individual civil suits had been brought against the owners of the Ash Building, Harris and Blank settled. They paid $75 per life lost to the victims' families, a small fraction of the approximate $400 per life lost paid to them by their insurer. But vilifying just Blank and Harris lets the entire system off the hook. They played a game and they were successful at it, but the rules of the game were crooked. The Triangle Company continued to operate until 1918. For the duration of the company's existence, workplace violations such as locked doors continued. There was a silver lining to the darkness. The first female cabinet member, Frances Perkins, who served as Secretary of Labor under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, had been an onlooker the day of the fire. Spurred by this trauma, Perkins was integral in enacting minimum wage and maximum hour laws, working to abolish child labor and guaranteeing workers the right to organize and bargain collectively through the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. Working conditions have definitely improved today, at least in reputable companies that are subject to inspection. But in a lot of industries, that's a result of what unions have fought for for decades. And since the New Deal, every generation of Americans must renew its commitment to those worker protections. Every time safety is compromised in the name of profit or, or productivity or economic gain, we set ourselves up for another triangle fire. It's going to keep happening unless we are vigilant. <laughs>